In my previous update on Russian military operations in Ukraine regarding the Kherson offensive, I talked about how the Western media and even Ukraine itself is downgrading it from this major offensive to what they're referring to or describing as grinding operations. And just to uh, just to give you an example, let's look at this Newsweek article right here. Ukraine plans systematic grinding of Putin's army to take Kherson official. And this is what they say. Uh, As Ukraine seeks to regain Kherson, a city that Russia has occupied since the beginning of its invasion, the Ukrainian strategy involves systematic grinding of Putin's army, an advisor to Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal published Saturday, Oleksiy Aristovich said there is no rush to take back the city and that when it comes to targeting the Russians, the Ukrainian forces are seeking to uncover their operational logistical supply system and destroy it with artillery and high Mars, which is exactly what they were doing before the offensive began. So what, what this is is an indirect admission that the offensive completely failed and they are right back to where they started this long range warfare that they are at the losing end of. The article also says, Justin Connelly, a senior U.S. Air Force fellow at the Atlantic Council Skullcroft Center for Strategy and Security, said in an interview published Thursday by the council that he expected Ukraine's strategy in Kherson to involve operations aimed at further weakening Russian defenses and supply lines rather than a full-scale conventional raid to retake terrain. Well, there was a raid, it was full scale, and it failed. So they're back to shaping operations. But since they're not shaping anything ahead of another offensive, I don't believe they have the ability to carry out another offensive on this scale. This is just a return to, again, losing this long range warfare that quite frankly, Russia prefers. And uh, this is why we we always hear the Western media, uh, Western officials saying how slow Russia is on the battlefield. This is why Russia is taking it slow, because if you rush across well-defended territory, your army will be destroyed, which is what happened to Ukraine. They suffered catastrophic losses. And is that all just Putin propaganda? Uh, These things we're seeing on Telegram, uh, long lines of ambulances rushing injured Ukrainians to the hospital, uh, blood drives. Is all of this Putin propaganda or not? And uh, it's always hard to, to verify what you see on Telegram. But we have articles like this, finally, from the Washington Post. Ukrainians line up to donate blood to save soldiers who are fighting for us. Hundreds of civilians and soldiers lined up Saturday in response to calls for blood donations in the southern frontline city holding off Russian forces. It also says the army has blocked reporters from frontline areas since the campaign started, leaving Mikolaev residents to scour telegram channels and group chats to follow its progress. The need is critical right now, said Vladislav Vekka, 25, a soldier from Mikolaev who got a day's leave to donate blood. His city, where the site of speeding military ambulances was common this past week, is in range of Russian reprisal attacks. So it's not RT or the Kremlin saying this. It is the Washington Post saying this, confirming this, this information that we see all across Telegram. What went wrong? What went wrong with this grand offensive that they had been preparing for for months and everyone knew was coming and uh, if you're supporting the government in Kiev and Ukrainian forces, this offensive that you had all of your hopes pinned on, uh, what went wrong? Well, a, a couple of things went wrong. Number one, correlation of forces. This means the number of forces that you have and not just the number of troops that you have, but the type of troops that you have versus your opponent. When you are on the attack, you need to have a numerical advantage over defenders. Uh, uh, A lot of people cite this number three to one. You have to have forces three to one, but you also have to have the right type of troops engaged in this attack. If you're 
using light infantry, you have a three to one advantage. You're using light infantry, uh, a limited amount of armor, and you're going up against heavy armor, long range artillery, rockets, uh, military aviation. You lack any sort of substantial air cover. Your three to one advantage is not going to help you. So it's quantity and quality. This is what makes up correlation of forces. And across the Western media, and we've all been reading the same articles from the Western media, they were saying that the number of Ukrainians attacking is about the same number of Russians who were defending. We all know that Russia outguns Ukraine in terms of long-range weaponry. We know that they outmatch Ukraine in terms of military aviation. And so it was a complete mismatch. The correlation of forces completely favored Russia in every aspect imaginable, and yet someone somewhere still ordered this counteroffensive. What else went wrong? Poor planning, very poor planning, and that can mean a lot of things. Uh, but in addition to a poor correlation of forces, it seems that Ukraine and their Western advisors have a very poor understanding of Russian military capabilities. Uh, we saw Ukraine using aggressive maneuver warfare. Uh, they were attempting to charge over open territory, get, get past this long-range fire of Russia and close in on Russian positions. And they, they attempted to do this in several areas, and the goal appears to have been to overload or to saturate the Russian battalion tactical group's ability to acquire and uh, destroy targets. And what is a battalion tactical group, a BTG? I've talked about this uh, many times. They are the basic building block of R Russian military operations out on the battlefield. They comprise of between 600 to 1,000 troops. And compared to the size of the unit, it has a huge amount of heavy weaponry. And we're talking everything from uh, tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, and armored personnel carriers to armored vehicles with anti-tank guided missiles on them. Field artillery, so you have self-propelled guns, you've got multiple launch rocket systems, you also have uh, a group of mobile air defense systems, you have engineering, support, and command vehicles, all of this uh, making up one battalion tactical group. And the way Russia has been using the BTG in Ukraine is uh, it is held back and in front of it are local militias. They are the, the infantry fighting on the ground. A BTG does not have a sufficient number of infantry to do the sort of things that you need to do when you're on the offensive or, or even sometimes on the defensive. So they rely heavily on militias as uh, support, infantry support, and the BTG stays back with its heavy weapons and it covers those those infantry as they as they do their job uh, these btgs have to work together i mean it's a group of 600 to a thousand troops there's only so much territory a single btg can cover so you'll have multiple btgs deployed in an area like kherson this requires not only good communication between the btg itself and the supporting infantry but also between the BTG itself and other BTGs in the area. Now, the West has claims uh, all throughout this conflict since uh, late February that Russia has serious problems with logistics and command and control and also communications. They said Russia is deficient in all of these. And to be honest, I think a lot of this comes from uh, either an actual misunderstanding of what Russia was doing in the opening phase of this operation, or or this is done deliberately just to uh, diminish Russian capabilities in the, the minds of the Western public. But actually, if you've been following this carefully, you'll notice a lot of analysts have walked back on this, claiming that that might not have been accurate, or uh, they'll have the caveat that, well, they've solved it since then. And I'm, I'm thinking that it's probably a little bit of both. It wasn't as bad as depicted. And since the beginning of the operation, they have learned from what they've done and they've, uh, they've improved upon it. But understanding this perceived weakness of the BTG 
uh, a lack of infantry, an inability to communicate between the BTG itself and the supporting infantry, and an uh, inability to coordinate among various BTGs. With all of these weaknesses in mind, I want to show you this. This is armor. Mounted Maneuver Journal, Spring 2017. And uh, the article in particular I want to show you is by US Army Captain uh, Nicholas J. Fiore, and it's titled, Defeating the Russian Battalion Tactical Group. And the link will be in the video description below. I think the, I think the paper gets a lot wrong, but I still think that it's an interesting paper. I and mean, if you're following this conflict, it, it, it'll give you a lot of insight into how America perceives Russia, its ability to fight, and what they think these BTGs are all about. Uh, and whether you agree with their analysis or not, at least you know where they're, they're coming from. So ultimately, wh what this article is saying is that BTGs have a huge amount of firepower. They could erase enemy uh, formations off of the battlefield. And if an opponent, say a US brigade combat team, if uh, a brigade, com a brigade combat team uses aggressive dispersed maneuver, it can overload the BTG's ability to acquire and destroy targets. Uh, they, you know, also, if this is true, if there's a, a poor communication between BTGs or between BTGs and their supporting infantry, it'll make this problem even worse. It'll make it even easier to overwhelm a BTG. Even though they have superior firepower, you could uh, you could saturate their ability to target and destroy your forces, and you can run them off the battlefield. So let's let's just read a little bit from this paper, and 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 then let's apply it to what we just saw on the Kherson offensive. It says the BTG will presume fires electronic warfare and air defense artillery superiority in the anticipated fight. They're talking about between a, a battalion tactical group and an American brigade combat team, which is about 3,000 to 5,000 strong. It says, but numerically, the BCT fields many more combat systems and has much better sustainment reach. Well, they're talking about an American brigade combat team. And you can see that the United States and its allies have tried to, in, in many ways, form Ukrainian forces into brigades and specifically have them fight like an American brigade combat team would. You, you can see that that is what they were trying to do. But the problem is Ukraine does not have good, especially now they do not have good sustainment reach for any of their units, especially something the size of a brigade, if they even have full strength brigades on the battlefield. The article also says, these two factors become the, the brigade combat teams asymmetric advantage. The Russian battalion tactical group knows it has to destroy four times more Americans than it takes in casualties to consider an engagement a tactical success. And I would say this would go for any engagement between a Russian BTG and a Ukrainian, Ukrainian forces, a Ukrainian brigade, for example. Assume that the BTG strike will disrupt the US command and control needed to coordinate a brigade level attack. The attack may also neutralize the brigade reserve and fires batteries. Therefore, every US battalion and company should have a ready to execute attack planned and rehearsed, including authority to initiate if communications are lost in an attack. The American brigade combat team must plan to counterattack on a broad front to assure that the threat is dangerous because if the BCT counterattacks on a narrow front, the Russian battalion tactical group will be able to mass to defend effectively. In other words, focus all of that uh, heavy weapon fire on a very narrow front and just destroy everything. If you're all spread out across a wide front, it makes it much harder to concentrate firepower. And that is exactly what Ukraine tried to do. They attacked across a very wide front. They didn't concentrate their forces really anywhere. And, and that is exactly what it looks like they tried to do, but it did not work. The article continues, in the face of penetrations on multiple axes, the battalion tactical group must withdraw to protect its fires and sustainment assets, which would abandon the paramilitary guard force. America, and they're, so they're talking about the auxiliary, the auxiliary troops, the, the infantry 
the militias, the local militias supporting the battalion tactical groups. American coalition forces can then surround, isolate, and reduce them to seize their territory. The combination of sustaining casualties, losing valuable equipment, and abandoning territory would significantly erode the Russian negotiation position to an extent unacceptable to the BTG chain of command. But that only works if, uh, say, this Ukrainian uh, counteroffensive was going up against individual BTGs that all just happen to be in the same area at the same time. If Russia didn't prepare defense in depth, defense in depth means uh, establishing a security zone. This would be an area way, way up front, your defensive lines, where you would try to detect and deal with the enemy before they even reach your defensive lines. Then you have multiple defensive lines, you have mobile reserve, you have all of these things, and in, 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 in essence, it is not just a bunch of BTGs and their auxiliary infantry out on the battlefield. Uh, Russia prepared what would essentially be division-level defenses around Kherson. That is what it looks like they did. So all, uh, this idea of overwhelming a, a Russian BTG and forcing it to fall back and, and isolating it from the, the supporting infantry and eliminating the infantry and seizing their territory, none of this was going to work because that is not how Russia prepared the defenses. Again, they prepared it as a division, all of these BTGs working together. Whatever problems they had back in 2014, 2015, uh, when this US Army captain and he's not coming up with these ideas on his own. This is this is the thinking that uh, you, you, you will find across the entire U.S. Army. This is how they think the Russian battalion tactical group operates. And they're drawing these conclusions from what they saw in 2014 and 2015, where they think Russian battalion tactical groups were in the Donbass region fighting. And they're, they're using the results of this fighting back then to shape their understanding of the battalion tactical group, at least as recently as 2017. Knowing all of this, how, how Russia has prepared defenses around Kherson, uh, any sound leadership in Kiev or among the Ukrainian general staff would never have ordered this offensive. Uh, Russia carried out by the book defensive operations. Uh, it looks like a division level defensive operation. And it reminds me a lot of the Battle of Kursk in World War II. This is this massive counteroffensive. Germany was preparing as they were falling back, back to Germany. And they were going to hit Russian, a Russian salient around Kursk. And they were preparing for it for months. And everyone saw them preparing for it for months, which means the Soviet troops around Kursk, they had the ability to prepare for it as well. The correlation of forces favored Soviet troops, and so the, the outcome was very predictable. It was a decisive victory for the Soviet Union, and then they continued pushing German troops back, back toward Berlin. And that's exactly what it looks like happened out, outside of Kherson. Now back to this paper, Defeating the Russian Battalion Tactical Group. It talks about overloading the BTG's intel, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities. And these are things like, like drones, for, for example. And it says, before shots are fired on the battlefield, a key task is to shape the battlefield by overloading the BTG's critical systems. The, BD, the BTG will attempt to defeat a brigade combat team by concentrating effects on individual US subunits in sequence. Although several of the BTG's high-end systems are technologically superior to the corresponding US equipment, this is a US Army captain admitting this, by the way, just uh, again, because I keep uh, trying to explain to people in my updates week to week that Russian military equipment is actually very good. This is a U.S. Army captain admitting that some of Russia's equipment is superior to U.S. equipment. Although several of the BTG's high-end systems are technologically superior to the corresponding U.S. equipment, the BTG doesn't have the capacity to observe, target, and attack the brigade combat team simultaneously across a broad front. Not only can a brigade combat team maneuver three times as many formations, the decentralized nature of U.S. mission command allows each formation to maneuver simultaneously and independent 
a brigade level direction. Therefore, the BDG must track, analyze, and counter each movement. But is that the case for a Ukrainian brigade? Are they able to do that? Do they have the training to do that? At this point in this conflict, the answer is no, no way. They have no way of doing this. It goes on and it says, unfortunately, the BTG is not resourced for burden of that magnitude and it doesn't have formal reach back protocols to use higher levels of analysis. An aggressive uh, brigade combat team can sustainably maneuver three times more platoons on the battlefield, increasing its survivability and also increasing the BTG's effort required to track. And this is what I said when Ukraine launched this counteroffensive. They were hoping that they sent so many troops and, and tanks and armored vehicles in so fast that Russia would not be able to target them at range efficiently enough to eliminate enough of them. By the time Ukrainian forces reach Russian positions, they would still have enough firepower to overwhelm the Russian positions and, and cause them to fall back. And it, it did not work. For the BTG to maintain contact, contact and an accurate situational awareness, assets must fly more hours. Again, they're talking about drones. Analysts must examine more footage and photography, and targets must be constantly updated. The Russian commander must either burn out his people and systems or accept risk to his recon assets and uncertainty in his reconnaissance picture. In effect, by executing high-tempo dispersion maneuvers, the U.S. Brigade combat team can sustainably burn more calories than its adversary. If the BTG tries to keep up, its systems will degrade rapidly before the first shots are fired. Again, these are under ideal conditions, and this is assuming that nothing in the battalion tactical group improved <laughs> since 2014-2015. So again, Ukraine attacked on a very broad, wide front. Uh, they, they used a large number of troops and vehicles. They tried to overload, uh, saturate Russia's ability to target and destroy these Ukrainian formations as they advanced. And uh, they wanted to try to cause enough losses among the battalion tactical groups. This uh, expensive, high-tech equipment that, that they perceived would be very hard for Russia to replace. And, and they assume that these BTGs are risk averse and they, they would like to avoid that and they would withdraw. And this would be the big gain in territory that Ukraine was hoping this offensive would materialize into. Now, I don't sit in on the meetings with the, the Ukrainian general staff. I don't know if this, this paper and the ideas that this U.S. Army captain was drawing from the, the ideas that were floating around the U.S. Army. If that was the inspiration for this operation, we know the U.S., the U.K., uh, other NATO members are assisting and advising Ukraine on the battlefield. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if some of these ideas carried over all the way to today. And this was part of the inspiration. This, this paper that we just went over is part of the inspiration uh, for this Kherson offensive. With the information that I have available to me at this time, I would say that Russia has successfully rectified these problems. They are able to network their battalion tactical groups into a at least a division level defensive operation. That is what we saw uh, in and around Kherson. They had their security zones where they detected and began dealing with Ukrainian forces moving toward their defensive lines. They had mobile reserves. Everyone knew they had mobile reserves. I, I was reading about it in the Western media, how Russia was building up the number of troops in and around Kherson and how they were uh, bringing in airborne troops, which would make perfect mobile reserve for, for counterattacks during uh, Ukraine's counteroffensive. And this looks like that is exactly what happened. And the, the offensive failed because Ukraine didn't have enough troops, didn't have the right kind of troops that they, they would have needed, and their plan was based on flawed assumptions about how Russia was organizing its defense, and it is a failure. We'll just keep an, an eye on it, the situation around Kherson, the situation overall in Ukraine. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. 
please check the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. I'm on Telegram. I update that several times a day. It is a good alternative for Twitter and Facebook, both of which I've been suspended from using. Uh, all of my videos on YouTube are automatically backed up on Rumble and Odyssey after a day or two. So uh, if for any reason YouTube censors me off of their platform, I will continue uploading videos on Rumble and Odyssey. In the video description below, you will find all of the links that I went over in this video, including the, uh, the PDF for this issue of Armor Magazine, where this, this article appears in. Also in the video description are ways you can help support my work. You can do that through Buy Me A Coffee, through Patreon, and also through PayPal. And to everyone who has been helping out month to month through one-time donations, or even if you're just helping share my work with others, I greatly appreciate all of that help. I could not do this work without that assistance. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.